We continue with the second half of the opinion of the court in National Pork Producers Council v. Ross. Part 4 Failing in their first theory, petitioners retreat to a second they associate with Pike v. Bruce Church, Inc. Under Pike, they say, a court must at least assess the burden imposed on interstate commerce by a state law and prevent its enforcement if the law's burdens are clearly excessive in relation to the putative local benefits. Petitioners then rattle off a litany of reasons why they believe the benefits Proposition 12 secures for Californians do not outweigh the costs it imposes on out-of-state economic interests. We see problems with this theory, too. Section A. In the first place, petitioners overstate the extent to which Pike and its progeny depart from the anti-discrimination rule that lies at the core of our dormant Commerce Clause jurisprudence. As this court has previously explained, no clear line separates the Pike line of cases from our core anti-discrimination precedents. While many of our dormant Commerce Clause cases have asked whether a law exhibits facial discrimination, several cases that have purported to apply, including Pike itself, have turned in whole or in part on the discriminatory character of the challenged state regulations. In other words, if some of our cases focus on whether a state law discriminates on its face, the Pike line serves as an important reminder that a law's practical effects may also disclose the presence of a discriminatory purpose. Pike itself illustrates the point. That case concerned an Arizona order requiring cantaloupes grown in state to be processed and packed in state. The court held that Arizona's order violated the dormant Commerce Clause, even if that order could be fairly characterized as facially neutral, the court stressed that it required business operations to be performed in-state that could more efficiently be performed elsewhere. The practical effects of the order in operation thus revealed a discriminatory purpose, an effort to insulate in-state processing and packaging businesses from out-of-state competition. Other cases in the Pike line underscore the same message. In Minnesota v. Cloverleaf Creamery Company, the court found no impermissible burden on interstate commerce because, looking to the law's effects, there was no reason to suspect that the gainers would be in-state firms or that the losers would be out-of-state firms. Similarly, in Exxon Corp. v. Governor of Maryland, the court keyed to the fact that the effect of the challenged law was only to shift business from one set of out-of-state suppliers to another. And in United Haulers, a plurality upheld the challenged law because it could not detect any discrimination in favor of in-state businesses or against out-of-state competitors. In each of these cases, and many more, the presence or absence of discrimination in practice proved decisive. Once again, we say nothing new here. Some time ago, Tracy identified the congruity between our core dormant Commerce Clause precedents and the Pike line. Many lower courts have done the same. So have many scholars. Nor does any of this help petitioners in this case. They not only disavow any claim that Proposition 12 discriminates on its face, they nowhere suggest that an examination of Proposition 12's practical effects in operation would disclose purposeful discrimination against out-of-state businesses. While this court has left the courtroom door open to challenges premised on even non-discriminatory burdens, and while a small number of our cases have invalidated state laws that appear to have been genuinely non-discriminatory, petitioners' claim falls well outside Pike's heartland. 
That is not an auspicious start. Section B. Matters do not improve from there. While Pike has traditionally served as another way to test for purposeful discrimination against out-of-state economic interests, and while some of our cases associated with that line have expressed special concern with certain state regulation of the instrumentalities of interstate transportation, petitioners would have us retool Pike for a much more ambitious project. They urge us to read Pike as authorizing judges to strike down duly enacted state laws regulating the in-state sale of ordinary consumer goods, like pork, based on nothing more than their own assessment of the relevant laws, costs, and benefits. That we can hardly do. Whatever other judicial authorities the Commerce Clause may imply, that kind of freewheeling power is not among them. Petitioners point to nothing in the Constitution's text or history that supports such a project. And our cases have expressly cautioned against judges using the Dormant Commerce Clause as a roving license for federal courts to decide what activities are appropriate for state and local government to undertake. While there was a time when this court presumed to make such binding judgments for society under the guise of interpreting the Due Process Clause, we have long refused pleas like petitioners to reclaim that ground in the name of the Dormant Commerce Clause. Not only is the task petitioners propose one the Commerce Clause does not authorize judges to undertake, this court has also recognized that judges often are not institutionally suited to draw reliable conclusions of the kind that would be necessary to satisfy the Pike test as petitioners conceive it. Our case illustrates the problem. On the cost side of the ledger, petitioners allege they will face increased production expenses because of Proposition 12. On the benefits side, petitioners acknowledge that Californians voted for Proposition 12 to vindicate a variety of interests, many non-economic. How is a court supposed to compare or weigh economic costs to some against non-economic benefits to others? No neutral legal rule guides the way. The competing goods before us are insusceptible to resolution by reference to any juridical principle. Really, the task is like being asked to decide whether a particular line is longer than a particular rock is heavy. Faced with this problem, petitioners reply that we should heavily discount the benefits of Proposition 12. They say that California has little interest in protecting the welfare of animals raised elsewhere, and the law's health benefits are overblown. But along the way, petitioners offer notable concessions, too. They acknowledge that states may sometimes ban the in-state sale of products they deem unethical or immoral without regard to where those products are made, for example, goods manufactured with child labor. And, at least arguably, Proposition 12 works in just this way, banning from the state all whole pork products derived from practices its voters consider cruel. Petitioners also concede that states may often adopt laws addressing even imperfectly understood health risks associated with goods sold within their borders. And again, no one disputes that some who voted for Proposition 12 may have done so with just that sort of goal in mind. So even accepting everything petitioners say, we remain left with the task no court is equipped to undertake. On the one hand, some out-of-state producers who choose to comply with Proposition 12 may incur new costs. On the other hand, the law serves moral and health interests of some disputable magnitude for in-state residents. 
some might reasonably find one set of concerns more compelling. Others might fairly disagree. How should we settle that dispute? The competing goods are incommensurable. Your guess is as good as ours. More accurately, your guess is better than ours. In a functioning democracy, policy choices like these usually belong to the people and their elected representatives. They are entitled to weigh the relevant political and economic costs and benefits for themselves and try novel social and economic experiments if they wish. Judges cannot displace the cost-benefit analyses embodied in democratically adopted legislation guided by nothing more than their own faith in Mr. Herbert Spencer's social statics, see Lochner v. New York, 1905, or, for that matter, Mr. Wilson Pond's pork production systems. If, as petitioners insist, California's law really does threaten a massive disruption of the pork industry, if pig husbandry really does imperatively demand a single uniform nationwide rule, they are free to petition Congress to intervene. Under the Wakeful Commerce Clause, that body enjoys the power to adopt federal legislation that may preempt conflicting state laws. That body is better equipped than this court to identify and assess all the pertinent economic and political interests at play across the country. And that body is certainly better positioned to claim democratic support for any policy choice it may make. But so far, Congress has declined the producer's sustained entreaties for new legislation. And with that history in mind, it is hard not to wonder whether petitioners have ventured here only because winning a majority of a handful of judges may seem easier than marshalling a majority of elected representatives across the street. Section C. Even as petitioners conceive Pike, they face a problem. As they read it, Pike requires a plaintiff to plead facts plausibly showing that a challenged law imposes substantial burdens on interstate commerce before a court may assess the law's competing benefits or weigh the two sides against each other. And tellingly, the complaint before us fails to clear even that bar. To appreciate petitioner's problem, compare our case to Exxon. That case involved a Maryland law prohibiting petroleum producers from operating retail gas stations in the state. Because Maryland had no in-state petroleum producers, Exxon argued, the law's divestiture requirements fell solely on interstate companies and threatened to force some to withdraw entirely from the Maryland market or incur new costs to serve that market. All this, the company said, amounted to a violation of the Dormant Commerce Clause. This court found the allegations in Exxon's complaint insufficient as a matter of law to demonstrate a substantial burden on interstate commerce. Without question, Maryland's law favored one business structure, independent gas station retailers, over another, vertically integrated production and retail firms. The law also promised to increase retail gas prices for Maryland consumers, allowing some to question its wisdom. But the court found Exxon failed to plead facts leading either logically or, as a practical matter, to the conclusion that the state was discriminating against interstate commerce. The company failed to do so because, on its face, Maryland's law welcomed competition from interstate retail gas station chains that did not produce petroleum. And as far as anyone could tell, the law's practical effect 
wasn't to protect in-state producers. It was to shift market share from one set of out-of-state firms to another. This court squarely rejected the view that this predicted change in the market structure would impermissibly burden interstate commerce. If the Dormant Commerce Clause protects the interstate market from prohibitive or burdensome regulations, the court held, it does not protect particular firms or particular structures or methods of operation. If Maryland's law did not impose a sufficient burden on interstate commerce to warrant further scrutiny, the same must be said for Proposition 12. In Exxon, vertically integrated businesses faced a choice. They could divest their production capacities or withdraw from the local retail market. Here, farmers and vertically integrated processors have at least as much choice. They may provide all their pigs the space the law requires. They may segregate their operations to ensure pork products entering California meet its standards, or they may withdraw from that state's market. In Exxon, the law posed a choice only for out-of-state firms. Here, the law presents a choice primarily, but not exclusively, for out-of-state businesses. California does have some pork producers affected by Proposition 12. In Exxon, as far as anyone could tell, the law threatened only to shift market share from one set of out-of-state firms to another. Here, the pleadings allow for the same possibility, that California market share previously enjoyed by one group of profit-seeking out-of-state businesses, farmers who stringently confine pigs and processors who decline to segregate their products, will be replaced by another, those who raise and trace Proposition 12 compliant pork. In both cases, some may question the wisdom of a law that threatens to disrupt the existing practices of some industry participants and may lead to higher consumer prices. But the Dormant Commerce Clause does not protect a particular structure or method of operation. That goes for pigs no less than gas stations. Think of it another way. Petitioners must plead facts plausibly suggesting a substantial harm to interstate commerce, facts that render that outcome a speculative possibility are not enough. In an effort to meet this standard, petitioners allege facts suggesting that certain out-of-state farmers and processing firms will find it difficult to comply with Proposition 12 and may choose not to do so. But the complaint also acknowledges that many producers have already converted to some form of group housing, even if they have not all met Proposition 12 standards. From these facts, the complaint plausibly alleges that some out-of-state firms may face difficulty complying or may choose not to comply with Proposition 12. But from all anyone can tell, other out-of-state competitors seeking to enhance their own profits may choose to modify their existing operations or create new ones to fill the void. Of course, as the complaint alleges, a shift from one set of production methods to another promises some costs. But the complaint concedes that complying producers will be able to pass along at least some of their increased costs to consumers. And no one thinks that costs ultimately borne by in-state consumers thanks to a law they adopted counts as a cognizable harm under our Dormant Commerce Clause precedents. Nor does the complaint allege facts plausibly suggesting that out-of-state consumers indifferent to pork production methods will have to pick up the tab, let alone explain how petitioners might sue to vindicate their interests. Instead, at least one declaration incorporated by reference into the complaint avers some out-of-state consumers will not value these changes 
and will not pay an increased price. Further experience may yield further facts, but the facts pleaded in this complaint merely allege harm to some producers' favored methods of operation. A substantial harm to interstate commerce remains nothing more than a speculative possibility. Section D. The Chief Justice's concurrence in part and dissent in part, call it the lead dissent, offers a contrasting view. Correctly, it begins by rejecting petitioners' almost per se rule against laws with extraterritorial effects. And correctly, it disapproves reading Pike to endorse a free-willing judicial weighing of benefits and burdens. But for all it gets right, in other respects, it goes astray. In places, the lead dissent seems to advance a reading of Pike that would permit judges to enjoin the enforcement of any state law restricting the sale of an ordinary consumer good if the law threatens an excessive harm to the interstate market for that good. It is an approach that would go much further than our precedents permit, so much further, in fact, that it isn't clear what separates the lead dissent's approach from others it purports to reject. Consider an example. Today, many states prohibit the sale of horse meat for human consumption. But these prohibitions harm the interstate market for horse meat by denying outlets for its sale. Not only that, they distort the market for animal products more generally by pressuring horse meat manufacturers to transition to different products, ones they can lawfully sell nationwide. Under the lead dissent's test, all it would take is one complaint from an unhappy out-of-state producer, and presto, the Constitution would protect the sale of horse meat. Just find a judge anywhere in the country who considers the burden to producers excessive. The same would go for all manner of consumer products currently banned by some states, but not by others, goods ranging from fireworks to single-use plastic grocery bags. Rather than respecting federalism, a rule like that would require any consumer good available for sale in one state to be made available in every state. In the process, it would essentially replicate under Pike's banner, petitioners' almost per se rule against state laws with extraterritorial effects. Seeking a way around that problem, the lead dissent stumbles into another. It suggests that the burdens of Proposition 12 are particularly substantial because California's law carries implications for producers as far-flung as Indiana and North Carolina. Why is that so? Justice Kavanaugh's solo concurrence in part and dissent in part says the quiet part out loud. California's market is so lucrative that almost any in-state measure will influence how out-of-state profit-maximizing firms choose to operate. But if that makes all the difference, it means voters in states with smaller markets are constitutionally entitled to greater authority to regulate in-state sales than voters in states with larger markets. So much for the Constitution's fundamental principle of equal sovereignty among the states. The most striking feature of both dissents, however, may be another one. They suggest that, in assessing a state law's burdens under Pike, courts should take into account not just economic harms, but also all manner of derivative harms to out-of-state interests. These include social costs that are difficult to quantify, such as, in this case, costs to the national pig population, animal husbandry traditions, and again, industry practice. But not even petitioners read Pike so boldly. While petitioners argue that Proposition 12 does not benefit pigs, as California has asserted, they have not asked this court or any court to treat putative harms to out-of-state animal welfare 
or other non-economic interests as freestanding harms cognizable under the Dormant Commerce Clause. Nor could they have proceeded otherwise. Our decisions have authorized claims alleging burdens on commerce. They do not provide judges a roving license to reassess the wisdom of state legislation in light of any conceivable out-of-state interest, economic or otherwise. Part 5 Before the Constitution's passage, Rhode Island imposed special taxes on imported New England rum. Connecticut levied duties on goods brought into the state by land or water from any of the United States of America, and Virginia taxed vessels coming within the state from any of the United States. Whether moved by this experience or merely worried that more states might join the bandwagon, the framers equipped Congress with considerable power to regulate interstate commerce and preempt contrary state laws. In the years since, this court has inferred an additional judicially enforceable rule against certain especially discriminatory state laws adopted even against the backdrop of congressional silence. But extreme caution is warranted before a court deploys this implied authority. Preventing state officials from enforcing a democratically adopted state law in the name of the Dormant Commerce Clause is a matter of extreme delicacy, something courts should do only where the infraction is clear. Petitioners would have us cast aside caution for boldness. They have failed, repeatedly, to persuade Congress to use its Express Commerce Clause authority to adopt a uniform rule for pork production. And they disavow any reliance on this court's core dormant Commerce Clause teachings focused on discriminatory state legislation. Instead, petitioners invite us to endorse two new theories of implied judicial power. They would have us recognize an almost per se rule against the enforcement of state laws that have extraterritorial effects, even though this court has recognized since Gibbons that virtually all state laws create ripple effects beyond their borders. Alternatively, they would have us prevent a state from regulating the sale of an ordinary consumer good within its own borders on non-discriminatory terms, even though the Pike line of cases they invoke has never before yielded such a result. Like the courts that faced this case before us, we decline both of petitioners' incautious invitations. The judgment of the Ninth Circuit is affirmed. <laughs> We've come to the end of the opinion. Until next episode, thanks for listening to What SCOTUS Wrote Us.